This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now. He puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGaulle. The Chris DeGaulle Podcast is presented by USMedicalPlan.com. Save big money monthly and get better health coverage at USMedicalPlan.com. Welcome in. It's Friday, the second day of June, and I thank you so much for downloading the Chris DeGaulle Show Podcast. Coming up today, uh, Tommy Laren is back. She is the host of Tommy Laren is Fearless on Outkick. Dot com. She's a Fox News contributor, Fox Nation, and I will warn you, I will warn you, like, don't don't shoot the messenger, don't get mad, you Trump people who are pro-Trump and all in on Trump. Tommy clearly has moved, uh, I think, away from Trump and toward DeSantis, and that's okay. That's her prerogative. As I've said, you're going to hear pro-Trump and pro-DeSantis people on this show. I'm going to try to give a fair hearing to everybody. Um, we have a great conversation aside from the primary. We have a great conversation on... Uh, her husband happens to be in Major League Baseball, and one of the things that's been most interesting to me this week culturally is the Dodgers and this disgusting group that the Dodgers are welcoming called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence that just mock Christianity and Catholicism generally. Uh, the Dodgers canceled their appearance originally, then said, oh, we're very sorry, Sisters of the Perpetual Indulgence, come on in. Uh, that led Clayton Kershaw, one of the stars of their team, a pitcher, to speak out and say, we're going to have a faith and family night here at the Dodgers in answer to this. He wasn't really particularly critical other than he said, I don't think we should host things that make fun of people's religion. But baseball players in particular have been interesting because obviously we're talking about the Dodgers. So you had a Nationals pitcher speak out. Then you had a, uh, a pitcher for the Blue Jays just retweet something or repost something on Instagram. And it got him in such trouble with the front office, he had to come out and issue an apology. Tommy knows a lot of these people. Uh, and her husband does too because he's in professional baseball. So I wanted to know from her perspective what she thought of that. Also, coming up, a brilliant guy. And it's apropos of nothing, but I thought because it's Friday and it's just a little change of pace. Yes, I'm going to get into uh, the Biden fall as well and the way that's being covered, which is kind of ridiculous. But uh, um, Gad Saad is this gentleman's name. And uh, Gad Saad is a professor. What is his title? His specific title is... Let me get it right, because he's do it. Evolutionary behavioral scientist, professor of marketing at Concordia University. He's written a book called The Sad Truth About Happiness. S-A-A-D is his last name. The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life. It's a great conversation um, about happiness, how to pursue it. He studied it. I thought it would, uh, he, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Parasitic Mind, which was brilliant, and we had a great conversation with him then. We talk about what COVID did to us mentally. I think you'll really enjoy the conversation. Speaking of conversations, I think you'll enjoy. The Harumph Society is definitely a place you will enjoy. Next week, I'll release the conversation with Chadwick Moore um, for consumption. But uh, right now, it is up at the Harumph Society. Chadwick has authored the book on Tucker Carlson. And it's posted right now at my Wednesday post on the Harumph Society. Today... Um, in fact, as soon as I'm done with uh, all my radio shows and I put this podcast to bed, as you by the time you listen to this, it's very likely that uh, today, my conversation with Julie Kelly, I'm going to post as a preview to Harumphers before it airs next week. And if you want to hear it, just become a $5 a month subscriber. That's it. It's a measly little 5 bucks a month. I pu publish three newsletters a, a week, and I think it's pretty solid stuff. I hope you'll enjoy it. But Julie and I have a half-hour conversation about the January 6th tapes. Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House, has given Julie and John Solomon, our friend from Just the News, Julie and John and one other person, access to these J6 tapes. She's going to Washington. She's been in the room. She's physically sat down and studied these tapes. What has Julie learned so far? What has she seen? What more will we learn and see? It's a deep dive conversation for those of you that are curious about the J6 tapes and feel like we've only scratched the surface. I think you're going to feel uh, satisfied with Julie's dogged determination to get to the bottom of all that we can learn from these tapes. So that is at the Harumph Society. Become a subscriber, and that's how you can hear it today or this weekend at your leisure. Let me tell you, uh, first of all, a big, big thank you to all of you who subscribe to this podcast and listen to it, and most of all, a thank you to those of you who support the sponsors of this podcast. 
The title sponsor of this show, the guy that keeps the lights on in the building, is a guy called John Ruhlman. And you can watch my video conversation with John at chrisstigall.com. But every single person that I talk about or endorse during this podcast, your calls and your support, your inquiry, telling them that you heard about their, their business on this podcast helps our podcast stay afloat. So thank you for supporting John Ruhlman and giving him a call. But it's more than just selfish. It's more than just me asking you to help me and do me a solid. It's really, I'm asking you to save yourself some money. 30 to 60%. If you buy your own health insurance, John Ruhlman is absolutely who you have to call. His team at usmedicalplan.com. Log on to usmedicalplan.com. Look for my smiling mug. You're not on the right site if you don't see my picture. usmedicalplan.com or call 877-410-4321. If you buy your own health insurance, if you're a retiree, on a fixed income and you take Medicare coverage. If uh, you're a younger, healthy person, there are insurance plans out there that cost you a fraction of what you're paying through work right now. And on top of all that, they could actually pay you if, God forbid, you ever need to be hospitalized. Health insurance is tricky. It's bureaucratic. It's very expensive. But I have personal relationships that have saved thousands of dollars by picking up the phone and giving it two minutes to tell them the kind of coverage you're currently paying for out of pocket and then John says, have you considered this? They crunch some numbers. They move some stuff around. John handles it all. Next thing you know, you've got better insurance, and you're saving hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month. Come on. Call John Ruhlman, 877-410-4321, usmedicalplan.com, or watch my conversation with John at chrisstegall.com. I have to tell you that um, we've seen a lot in our time together covering news and events covering a few administrations now i've um i've been doing talk radio long enough that i guess this would be my fourth presidency two of them two terms so i've been doing it long enough now i've seen several come and go i've seen lots of campaigns i've seen lots of campaign stops i've seen lots of errors i've seen lots of flubs we've covered extraordinary moments together we've talked about things that are Crazy, angering, silly, funny. I I don't think, and I'm actually really sincere about this. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like I saw yesterday. And I never thought I'd see it. I never thought I would actually see the bottom of the president of the United States' shoes. I I, I mean, look... A stumble, a slip, a trip, an incident, fine. I've never seen a president go down in a heap since the Kennedy assassination like this. I've never seen something like that. Uh, but Joe Biden was not assassinated. He, he just fell. And, and I'm telling you, at his age, if your parents or uh, you or a loved one called you at, what is he, his late 70s? He's pushing 80. If somebody called you pushing 80 and said, I just took a nasty fall. Would you? Would that worry you? Seriously, if you know someone of a certain age, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't want to embarrass my parents, but if my parents, if I saw one of my parents who just turned 70 this year, all right, my folks are, in, they are 7-0, both of them. And if I was out to lunch with them and I saw one of them fall the way Joe Biden fell yesterday, I wouldn't go, oh, he dust it off, shake it off. You're fine, Dad. Get up. Let's go have a nap. And that's what they're <laughs> – I mean, when you, when you turn on the news this morning and, and the guys reading the news go, oh, top of the news today. And this is what I heard. I heard one guy say this this morning. Uh, in the news today, uh, Joe Biden takes a nasty fall at the Air Force commencement ceremony. He's fine. Like – this is what I'm saying. He's of an age and he's of a state and he's of a frailty. And it is not making fun of the man. It, it, I'm not. The truth of the matter is he is of an age and he is in a condition and we all see it. Democrats see it. You see it. I see it. We all see it. He's of an age and a frailty that when you see someone like that take a spill like that, I know you say his bike. But even the bicycle I'll excuse because people fall off bicycles. This is just walking. Well, all right, yes, I suppose we did see the bottom of his shoes going up the ramp. But again, <laughs> yes, he's fallen going up the ramp too. <laughs> but again, this is this is a flat surface. 
he's fine. In the news today, Biden falls. And just as a matter of imagery, that Air Force cadets are behind him when it happens. That picture, I would imagine, is playing in international war rooms uh, in hostile regimes all over the globe. I I would guess, boy, if you ever wanted the recruitment video for uh, Russian military or Chinese military, that's the one you run. Hey, join us. Over there, across the pond, that guy, the leader of the free world, look at this. Here he is in front of his cadets. And then clip to Xi with his, uh, you know, waving, whatever he does when they extend the hand out. And you got those guys marching with precision, almost like they're robots in the streets of Tiananmen Square. What an image. This is the only time I wish I did a TV show so I could cut to the clip and show it to you. But it, we have it, but it doesn't do us any good, the audio of it. Remember, Biden had quite a lot of fun with Donald Trump, who didn't fall at a West Point servant. You know, this came up. <laughs> you know what's interesting about this last night coming up at the Trump town hall? Trump had a friend asked me what qualifies as a town hall. That's a great question. Did you watch any of this? I did. And I regret that I did, but I did because I thought I was going to miss something or I was going to learn something. But Sean Hannity was involved, so naturally I didn't. Um, It was the Sean Hannity town hall featuring an appearance by Donald Trump and people in Iowa who were actually, you know, the the people that are supposed to be featured. That's the way it was. Like, it was 48 minutes of Sean talking about things, letting the president answer occasionally what Sean thought. And then at the end, a crudely edited edited two minutes with the guys who actually get to stand up and ask questions. It's a town hall. And a friend said, what exactly by definition is town hall? When you, when somebody says I'm hosting a town hall, what do you think? What I think, I mean, if, if your boss says, Hey, we're hosting an all staff town hall, that generally means I think in my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, employees are going to gather together and they're going to get to ask questions of the boss. That's what I think town halls are. But apparently the definition of town hall is now uh, everybody gets to sit in an audience and watch the host talk. That's the way Caitlin Collins did it, and that's the way Sean did it. In fact, I would submit to you that Caitlin Collins and CNN actually gave real people more time to talk in New Hampshire than Sean did last night in Iowa. They probably edited a lot of it out. It was edited for the hour. They didn't go over, so it was tightly edited, poorly edited, too. So it was a lot of Sean droning on and on and on. And then literally like the last 10 minutes, two, you know, two seniors get up and say, I'm a veteran and I have concerns about the VA. And Trump answers a question about it. And they go, thanks. And then they do like a hard edit. It's this hard edit of Sean saying, thanks, Iowa. Good night. You know, and then off to Laura Ingram. It's a town hall. Anyway, it did come up. Biden's uh, frailty. And you know what's interesting? And. Trump will never be given credit for this. I was actually kind of taken aback by the exchange. Trump scolded Hannity. (laughs) Hannity brings up that Biden had taken a spill at the Air Force Academy uh, ceremony earlier. And did you see he asked the president, uh, former President Trump, did you see it? Trump said, yeah, yeah, saw it. And Sean then brings up voluntarily, which I'm not really sure why he did because it didn't make him look great. Sean said, hey, you, you, uh, you haven't really gone all in on piling on Biden about his cognitive impairment and stuff like that. You haven't really picked on him. And Trump said, yeah, you know, I called you about that, remember? I ca- <laughs> and I was like, uh-oh, what does that mean? Trump says he called Hannity once upon a time. Did you see this last night, Victoria? That it, it, I, I'm just curious what you thought of this. Trump said that he called Sean Hannity last year and said, ease up on Biden. Did you catch that? It I happened. Not. You didn't? That's, no. Yeah, I, I, it, it, and it was really quick if you didn't catch it. I was kind of amazed. 
Trump says, and, and, and Hannity confirms, that Trump calls up Sean and goes, hey, go easy on Biden with this cognitive impairment stuff. Don't make fun of it. It's very sad. It's very serious. Makes us look bad. Don't do it. And Hannity claims that he's like eased up. I now see the severity of it. I used to make fun of him with the sippy cup and blah, 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 but I don't anymore. Thanks for your phone call. I, <laughs> again, I, I didn't think it was like Sean's crowning achievement, one of his greatest moments to have the former president scolding him for restraint. But my point is, they're always talking about Donald Trump and restraint. I'm always hearing the big criticism of Donald Trump all the time is he needs to really restrain himself. He really needs to calm down. He really needs to do better. Uh, about holding his tongue and not, not popping off all the time. And I just wish he would be a little more restrained. Well, th that was one of the, uh, and he, by the way, he could. I mean, it did come up the fact, Sean reminded him that the husk was very quick to make fun of him for walking down a ramp at West Point a little awkwardly. We have it. Take a listen to this. Number 89. Uh, this is um, Biden, a little rewind to Biden making fun of Trump when he walked down a, a, a ramp that he was afraid he was going to slip on gingerly. Listen to this. Look at how he steps and look how I step. Watch how I run up ramps and he stumbles down ramps. OK, come on. <laughs> I mean, look, Trump's mindful of one thing. He goes, you can't fall like that. You can't. You, can, you just can't be seen doing that. And I do him at Trump. For Trump, image is everything. And he knows the significance of what that looks like. I actually believe, you may not, I believe Trump sees that and genuinely, sincerely having held the post and being on a world stage, I think he sees that and he says, that's, that's really bad for all of us. He knows how important imagery. Remember the hell he caught for, what was on the EU summits where he was, kind of sh what appeared to be shoving his way to the front of the pack of the global leaders. And then once he got to the front of the line, adjusted his jacket like there, I'm in my rightful place in front of everyone. He caught, remember when that was passed around and went viral? Look at this ogre, this boorish buffoon. Look at him asserting his alpha male dominance over the world. You see, that's what's wrong with this country. Okay, well, what do you think yesterday of the husk with his legs in the air, looking at the bottom of the soles of his shoes? in front of the Air Force cadets. Which would you rather have, I ask you? The, the guy saying, out of my way, get me to the front of the line, or the feeble husk who looks like he should be in traction this morning in front of the Air Force cadets. What, what would you rather have? I'm serious. On the global stage. Trump's keenly aware of that imagery. I think I heard them laughing, Chris. I don't know. There was a clip of them kind of chuckling when you it know, was happening. You know, I was, I was trying to be very – you're talking about when he fell? Yes. <laughs> I've been trying to be careful here because I've seen many people post clips of the fall, and I've been a little nervous to trust it because I've been yeah. burned – we've been burned a couple of times. It depends on the source of the audio. These days, you can never be too sure – I have been burned playing clips on this show before where people have called in later to say, yeah, that's not exactly the real audio that was edited in to make it sound like people reacted this way when they really didn't. So I don't know. But the, so you have audio of the actual tumble and you hear, I, I can't believe anybody's cheering. No one's, this can't be real. You think this is real? It sounded unedited to me, again, to your point. All right. Know, I guess, but it just sounded... Let's okay. uh, with, with caution, with caution, we play this. This is one of the clips floating around out there where there's a claim that perhaps there's either laughing or cheering or something. But, but take a listen. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I heard, this is, that is the clip that I heard, and I didn't trust it because I thought that doesn't seem like a natural crowd reaction to me. When you see a feeble, frail president of the United States collapse, it doesn't see, even I probably wouldn't go, woo! That just doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't seem like a natural human reaction. So I don't, listen, nothing would delight me more 
than if a bunch of Air Force cadets and their families were cheering uproariously to see the collapse of the... <laughs> no, that's not true. I, really, I, I, I don't cheer it. I don't cheer it. I'm a human being. I think it's sad. His, his little wispy hair blowing around in the wind yesterday, and then he puts on the little cap, and then the little fellow walks to his chair and collapses, and his legs go up in the air. I, I'm serious. It reminds me of my grandfather in his last days when we would help him from the chair to the Thanksgiving table. Come on, Grandpa, time to eat. But the thing about my grandfather was he was physically well. He, he couldn't see. My, gra my grandfather was was not able to see in his last days, so we had to help him around. I, It's so bad. All right, DeSantis was asked about it yesterday, number 90. Now, he did see, I think a lot of people saw, he had a fall at this Air Force uh, event. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if he sustained injuries, but I just want to say that... Um, uh, we hope uh, and wish Joe Biden a swift recovery from any injuries he may have sustained. But we also wish the United States of America a swift recovery from the injuries it has sustained because of Joe Biden and his policies. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, as for these town halls and ratings generally, CNN ratings crater a whopping 25 percent since last year despite the bump they got from the Trump town hall, I will predict, as I have before, once we get the overnight numbers of the Sean Hannity Trump, air quote, town hall, I, I will predict to you that there's going to be news in that and the news will likely be, I, I'll hold out the possibility I'm wrong. I could be, I might be reading this incorrectly, but I have a funny feeling. Fox has sustained some real hits. People are not watching Fox like they used to. I know I'm not. In fact, it was painful for me to even turn Fox on yesterday. It had nothing to do with Trump at all. I just, I knew what I was going to get. I knew it was going to be of the hour. It was going to be mostly Sean talking. And Sean talking doesn't interest me. He claimed last night, they ought to fact check the host of the town hall. Sean claimed he's on 700 radio stations. Rush was on 600 at his apex Sean Hannity is not on 700 radio stations. I know for a fact he's not on in this town. But uh, at any rate, <laughs> in fact, uh, I do two radio shows a day, and he's not on in either town I broadcast to. So I don't know how the math works that Sean has lost two major cities and has now somehow picked up a hundred more radio stations than Rush had at the peak of his career. I just, what a blowhard, that guy. I will predict that Sean's numbers for his little town hall last night with Donald Trump are actually going to be fewer than Caitlin Collins over on CNN. That's my prediction. And they will make news of it. And they will say it's Trump. And I will remind you, it has nothing to do with Trump. In fact, if I were advising the Trump people, I would say, stay the hell away from Sean Hannity and Fox. It's not doing you any favors. He doesn't. He's not helping him. Nobody wants to hear Sean bloviating to Trump about the ails of the country and what he thinks about it. Run for president, Sean, if you're that passionate about it. Otherwise, would you just ask the question and get the hell out of the way? What a blowhard. Anyway, CNN and Fox News both shed viewers year over year in May seeing particularly steep declines in prime time. MSNBC, the only network to see gains. Fox still remains technically the most watched. In the first full month since the firing of Tucker Carlson, they brought in just 1.4 million viewers in prime time. That's a 37% drop year over year. CNN's viewership sank to less than half a million viewers. <laughs> and they didn't have the numbers to lose as it is. Ha folks, prime time on a major global cable news network, and you can't muster half a million viewers? That's about as sad as it gets. Now listen, there are some people who believe, you, and I, I'm not sure I go for this, but there are some who would say this fall yesterday makes old Joe sympathetic and will distract from his troubles. There's real evidence out there, it appears, that he took a $5 million bribe. 
The walls are starting to close in on the Hunter Biden laptop so- story. Um, there's ample evidence, it appears, from the House oversight that the guy was on the take. We've all known that. Um, he's got massive political troubles. He's upside down in polls. Most head-to-head polls even have the ogre, the worst president ever in the history of America, Donald Trump, beating him. Biden's in a lot of trouble. There's a lot of bad news. Uh, I got this story in front of me from the Daily Caller today. The White House responding to a poll which indicates a majority of Americans believe Joe Biden was involved with his son in illegal influence peddling. Again, that Harvard-Harris poll, we played the audio of this yesterday shows 53% of Americans believe Joe Biden was involved in illegal influence peddling. Um, So there are some that think this is a Fetterman deal. Old Joe, being frail, takes a tumble, and now he becomes the poor old fella for whom we should feel very sorry and we should treat with kid gloves. I thought Ron DeSantis handled that pretty well. He said, we wish him a speedy recovery. We hope he wasn't hurt, but... We also wish this country a speedy recovery because of the damage he's done to us. I thought that was well said. Um, So the FBI is set to deliver this document that Comer wants on this bribery to Capitol Hill on Monday. I think they already have it in their possession, but again, they're trying to stave off the contempt uh, filings against FBI Director Chris Wray. So they're formally going to hand over what the House Oversight Committee wants, but Once the House Oversight Committee gets it, then they're probably prepared to go full throttle on at least trying to publicly prosecute this president. You may see impeachment over this. I would certainly think you should. I would think the House would take up articles of impeachment against the president if they genuinely believe he has been taking bribe money while vice president. Um, But I don't know. Does a fall like that make people feel sorry for Biden and make people forget that he may be on the hook? Like this Harvard Harris poll says 53 percent of Americans think he's taken money illegally. Does that make people forget that and feel sorry for him because he fell or that he's feeble? Can you said another way? Can you feel sorry for a guy or be concerned for his health while still thinking he's a crook? Can we do both at the same time? I think we can. Some people believe that um, this is like a Fetterman deal where, oh, the poor guy, he had a stroke. Don't be mean to him. I don't know if that works for this guy. I don't, I don't know if it translates. Fetterman's just one senator. This guy is president of the United States. I, I don't, I mean, we'll see. Again, I could be wrong. Who the hell knows? By Monday, we could start hearing stories. It may start trickling out today and this weekend. Old Joe, boy, that spill. Now we're learning some things. He's going in for some x-rays. Maybe he's, maybe his health becomes the story because that's a more welcome distraction. Even his fealty or his uh, feebleness, his frailty. Maybe that's enough of a distraction for them that at least they're not talking about him laundering money through his son from foreign governments. I, I don't know. Interesting from the Daily Caller this morning, millennial voters, a key part of the Democrat Party's electoral coalition, have begun moving right as they get older. This is according to data from the New York Times. Voters who were 18 to 29 years of age in the 2008 presidential election when they got so excited about the hope and change of Barack Obama. Those voters who backed Obama at roughly twice the margin they supported then-candidate Joe Biden in 2020. Millennials voted for Biden at a 55% clip compared to 43% for Donald Trump after exit polls showed a 51-45% margin among the cohort. In the 2022 midterm, voters aged 34 to 43 supported Democrat congressional candidates by a 10-point margin. The point is, the trend of millennials shifting right as they age is part of a larger pattern of Democratic cohorts becoming more conservative as they get older. Voters from most political cohorts under the age of 50 voted for Republicans in larger numbers in 2020 compared to 2012, with shifts most noticeable among older voters. Millennials shifting to the right is primarily a trend among older parts of the generation who came of age politically from 2004 to 2008. Um, I I think this is axiomatic. I don't know that this is necessarily revolutionary. It's a tale as old as time. 
the young idealistic kid gets his or her first paycheck and they are aghast at the taxes and you have to sit down and explain to them what's come out of their paycheck and they realize the heavy hand of government for the first time. There's a, there's a what is the saying? It's escaping me right now because it's, um, what is it? If, um, if, if you're not a Democrat when you're young, you have no heart. And if you're not voting a Republican when you're older, you have no brain or something like that. Young, young people are idealistic morons. They don't know what they, they, they have the feels about everything. They don't pay for anything. They, many of them still live at home. They're emotional idiots. This is why I've, I've said this a thousand times about this business. People always say, we got to get younger. We got to get younger. We got to get younger. I, I've heard that. I've been doing this now for, I don't know, 25 years. And I, every time I get together with a talk radio bunch of people and uh, people that are paid consultants, you know, I love people who, consultants. You know what consultants mean in my business? People that couldn't do this themselves for a living. So now they make a living running around telling everybody else how to do it. <laughs> in my business, those who can't teach, uh, those who can't coach, that's almost 100% true in my business. But I, I get together with these people from time to time. I used to. I don't go to them anymore. I used to actually think that going around kissing the rings of these people was important to my career. I'm over that. But I used to go to these things. I'd travel to these out-of-town conventions, and it was often focused on uh, conservative talk radio specifically. And so a lot of us hosts would get together in a room, and there'd be these puffed up, you know, um, program directors and puffed up management types, and, and they'd hold these seminars about how we really need to start um, streamlining our conversations on the air to be more broadly appealing. We need to start doing lifestyle radio. We need to start talking about, uh, you know, issues that appeal to the home. And, you know, uh, slice of life conversations. Do you like uh, bacon or sausage for your breakfast? Give me a call and tell me, bacon or sausage? Instinctively, I knew that wasn't true. I mean, Rush talked about years ago when he started his show and nobody was doing anything but lifestyle radio on talk radio. And he considered it a vast wasteland. I remember he used to tell stories of he'd flip around and he heard people reading cake recipes. He's like, this is so dull. You got to talk about what makes you animated, what's passionate to you. That's all you can do. But the other thing that these puffed up, bloviated uh, consultant types would talk about is we really need to reach younger people. You know, the demographics of talk radio are older, 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 older. And people kind of look out over a sea of older, more mature listeners or voters with kind of, I don't know, contempt or dismissiveness or something. Oh, I wish we had hipper, younger people in the room. And I always said, these are accomplished people who have made money. Like they have more money than any young person has by a lot. You give me a 70-year-old with money versus a broke 25-year-old? I want the 70-year-old with money listening to my show. I like that's it's a no-brainer. But anyway, it's always oh, we got to get younger people and I always say younger people are not conservative. Younger people barely know what's going on. That is not universally true. When young people grow up and they get jobs and they have families and they start paying taxes and they see the cost of everything, it's natural. And the only time people stay liberal most of the time is if they're broke and they have no ambition whatsoever and they want um, their butts wiped like children for the rest of their lives. Or they're exceedingly wealthy. They're very wealthy and they can afford to be a liberal. And talk about everybody else's money being taken because they don't notice that theirs is gone. They've got so much of it, they don't mind paying 70% tax rates. Seriously, have you ever met like a middle class liberal? There aren't many of them. And the ones that exist are the old school Democrat. Like the ones that are really committed Democrat leftists are always young idealists who are broke and have nothing. Or people who are broke and are on the take from government or people who are exceedingly wealthy. They're the most passionate liberals. If you meet any Democrat voters who are middle class, they're almost all old school Kennedy Democrats who don't really know they're conservative Republicans, but they, they, they feel a loyalty to their family lineage. My daddy worked the line at the shop and he's a union guy and I'm a union guy and so we vote Democrat. It's, it's just ingrained in them. It's not an ideology. It's just history. So, no, it doesn't surprise me that young people who voted Obama are now shifting away. 
reality. They're living reality now. And it's a little tough to see your president, you know, with his feet up in the air in front of Air Force cadets. That's a little hard to watch. I don't care what age you are. Have you watched the conversation with my pal Jason Perrett at Eagle Wealth Planning? He's the financial advisor there at Eagle Wealth Planning. He has a passion for providing financial services to those who are looking to pursue financial independence. I was talking with my one of my sons this weekend about a financial future, and he was thinking about things like Roth IRAs. He's been investigating this on his own. I said, you got to sit down with Jason, and we're going to do that soon. Listen, it doesn't matter where you are on your walk to financial freedom. Jason's main objective at Eagle Wealth Planning is to help clients pursue their goals because he's a fiduciary. He's dedicated to providing clients with complete wealth management and investment services, highly personalized professional assistance. It's not about what he pockets. All right. Jason can help accomplished entrepreneurs, professionals, retirees, or young people like my son just get started to a long-term financial independent road. He regularly revisits your goals and assesses your risk tolerance. We have a whole conversation about this at my website. Go to chrisstigall.com. You can watch my conversation with him. And it doesn't matter where you live. If you don't like your particular advisor or you don't have one, let Jason step in and see if he can take a look at your money, see if he can help it grow and get you to that place of financial independence that all of us are striving to get to. I think you're going to like the way he works. He's a blunt, no-nonsense kind of guy, tells you the truth, loves conversation. You're going to love working with him. Go to EagleWealthPlanning.com. That's EagleWealthPlanning.com. Or you can call Jason today at 816-394-8117. That's 816-394-8117. As always, there's a video conversation. Jason and I sit down and chat. Uh, it's at ChrisStigall.com. He's also linked at ChrisStigall.com so you can get a sense of Jason. Um, I always think it's important if you're going to talk about partnering with somebody, you should get to know them. You should see what they're all about. And you'll see in that conversation kind of Jason's character and the the way he thinks and talks and acts. I think you're going to like him a lot. So go to chrisstigall.com for more information or email him at jason at eaglewealthplanning.com. Securities and advisory services offered through Satera Advisors, LLC, member FINRA, SIPC, a broker-dealer, and registered investment advisor. Satera is under separate ownership from any other named entity. It's a sandbag. It's a sandbag. It's, it's fine. Everything's, it's, damn it. The Secret Service was so inconsiderate. They put a sandbag out there in front of the poor guy and tripped him up. It's all the the state, the Air Force cadets, whoever set up the teleprompter and the whole setup for uh, old Biden, they put a sandbag out there to hold it up and look what it did to him. Tripped him up. Why, that spry, nimble 80-year-old fella, he would have been upright and uh, never would have had a fall had somebody not put that sandbag in his way and tripped him up. CNN today with the wide shot. They, they highlighted it. They, they put the, the white oval over it to show you. I mean, they're doing like Zapruder film analysis of it. State-run media going into full cover for the husk this morning. Look, we've spotted it. Here's the sandbag he tripped over. In fact, I got some calls this morning already. Chris, you're not being fair. The poor guy tripped over a sandbag. It's a sandbag. He tripped. Okay. <laughs> Tommy Laren is back with us. I don't know if you watched Tommy's show yet. She's been doing some fantastic work uh, over at Fox Nation. She works with uh, the good people at Outkick as well. And Tommy, it was a sandbag attack on our poor president. And uh, I'm sure you feel as sorry for the fellow as I do. Good morning. Uh, yes, I do feel very sorry for him, but not because of a sandbag or a sand sandbag. I feel badly for him because he's elderly. He's a senior citizen, and he should not be serving in the office of the presidency. Quite frankly, he shouldn't be there now, and he certainly should not be running again in 2024. And the fact that the liberals are doing the mental gymnastics to try to make us think that this man is somehow a spring chicken just goes to show how disingenuous they are and why most Americans don't trust the fake news mainstream media. It's amazing. It's amazing. They're, they're, they're blaming. Oh, well, whatever. I've made my point. Glad to have you again, Tommy. I, I've been watching you with interest on social media here lately, <clears throat> and, and I think you're navigating something the same way I am because I think you're probably interested in being fair. I think you probably 
um, want the best of outcomes in the Republican primary to challenge this mess that we're living in at the moment. Uh, but you've seen it spill out the, the, the nastiness, the back and forth, particularly on Twitter between team Trump and team DeSantis. And I've been interested in watching you and others navigate it. What's your general kind of 30,000 foot view of it all? Well, I'll tell you this, you know, we knew that this primary was going to be contentious. We knew it was going to be a bloodbath and you know what, there's nothing wrong with competition. Uh, for me, this week was very disappointing uh, as somebody who has been a Trump supporter from the very early days back in 2015. Uh, this week was disappointing for me, especially when I saw Donald Trump go after my colleague and friend, Kaylee McEnany. Uh, that, to me, really hit home in, in a lot of ways, and it really bothered me. And I'm certainly not the only one that feels that way. You know, it's one thing if you want to argue about policy. It's another thing if, if you want to argue about who's better for the job. Uh, even if you want to make some low blows and, and call some names, which we knew Donald Trump was going to do, you know, that's one thing. But when you go after somebody like Kaylee McEnany, who has had your back, who has fought for you tooth and nail for so many years, uh, that was really upsetting to me, and I don't think it was a good look. So I hope that the former president received that message loud and clear. I hope that he won't do that anymore, and whoever is advising him, that that's a good idea. I hope that they've been fired, uh, and I hope that moving forward we can just get back to policy. And I don't know, maybe save some of the criticism for Joe Biden and Democrats instead of going after one another so fiercely. That would be nice. Yeah, um, it's it's an interesting thing because I, I, I think I go back to um, I, I remember going into the 2015, 2016 primary and and Trump was always pretty famous for for taking shots at people that you didn't think really warranted. I mean, I remember him going after Heidi Cruz. I remember him going after Ted Cruz's dad. I mean, stuff that I I didn't find particularly becoming at all. And I, I was a Cruz enthusiast, by the way. I was not an early Trump adopter. I've admitted that since. Um, and I, I ended up voting for him twice. But um I, I guess I just I'm kind of surprised at the reaction to Trump behaving the, that way, because that's that's not exactly new to me. No, it's not new, but I think uh, what it is, is we kind of expect some of that from Trump, uh, the name calling. You know, I remember, of course, uh, the little Marco and all the names <laughs> he had, low energy Jeb. I mean, crooked Hillary. Those don't really bother me. You know, I, I some of the shots that he took at the family of Ted Cruz, you're right, uh, didn't didn't sit well with me then. But I think what's really disappointing at this point is that this president, this former president demands loyalty from everybody. But in order to get loyalty, you have to give loyalty. And when you have somebody like a Kaylee McEnany who has given you loyalty for so many years, and she got a poll wrong, or in your mind, she got a poll number wrong, and so you eviscerate her the way that you did, you know, that to me was a whole different ballgame than what we've seen from this president. And that one to me was much different than, you know, what he typically does. How are you, um, how do you see the the DeSantis campaign launch? The, the Twitter thing last week, um, he's, he's rolling out to the early primary states this week, uh, Iowa, South Carolina, New Hampshire. Um, are you are you tilting that way in, in this primary to a, a, a pro DeSantis run? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm very impressed with Ron DeSantis, and I have been for many years. I mean, I remember uh, living in California at the start of COVID, and I remember looking to places like Florida and wishing that that was my leader. Then I moved to Tennessee, and I had a Republican governor, and I still wish that I had a leader like Ron DeSantis because there were a lot of Republican governors that didn't step up. So I've been a DeSantis fan for a very long time. Um, you know, the Twitter rollout thing, a lot of people criticize that. He tried something new, and I don't think we should attack him for that. And also, I think we need to be very honest about the fact that we need to try new things on the Republican side. Going on Twitter and trying to connect with a younger audience in a new way is not the worst thing that could happen. I work for Fox News. I love Fox News. But if you want to reach young people, maybe rolling out something on social media is a pretty ingenious way to do it. So I'm very impressed with Ron DeSantis. I think his fundraising numbers show that there are a lot of uh, former Trump supporters, current Trump supporters that are still very impressed with Donald Trump, but also really like Ron DeSantis. So I will say this. Both men need to earn my vote. You don't get the nomination through osmosis and you need to work for it. And that's what I want to see from both of them. I love them both, but let's have a competitive primary. But let's talk about policy and who can win. That's what I want to focus on. So you're not, you haven't gone to the extent of saying, here's my horse yet. <laughs> 
I'll tell you this. Um, I will be very critical of both sides, and I will give my honest opinion of who I think is our best shot. Um, and I think our best shot, and I've said this so many times, and I've said it for months, I think our best shot at getting back in the White House is Ron DeSantis. Okay. And, and if Ron DeSantis is our nominee, I think that we will sail into that White House. So I will say that, and I will stand behind that. Fair enough. Um, and yeah, no, no wrong answer. I mean, I know there's a lot of people in this audience that feel exactly the same way. Let me ask you this. Do you think Trump can't win? I hear this a lot from people. They've decided that there's no way if Trump becomes the nominee that he, he can win. Um, do you agree with that assessment? Well, I never say never. You know, everybody said that about Donald Trump, of course, in 2016, and they were wrong. You know, even the morning of the election, they had Hillary for, uh, Hillary Clinton winning by, what, 90-something percent. So I don't count out the man, but I will say this, because I'm very honest with my audience, with your audience. If he lost in 2020 and things have gotten worse <laughs> heading into 2024 when it comes to certain election integrity, mass mail and voting, ballot harvesting, I don't know how we could look at this and say, given everything and given the indictments and given the hatred for him has only grown, I'm not sure how we can sit back and say, you know, he lost it in 2020, but he's going to win it in 2024. I'm not sure that there's a pathway for that, to be honest. Uh, do you get the sense that Ronna McDaniel, head of the GOP and uh, Team DeSantis or Trump, I mean, that, this, I, I say this broadly to anybody that's running in opposition to Democrats. Do you think there is an organizational understanding, state level, nationally, of, of what it means to collect votes early? The fact that, you know, we, are, we are, Republicans traditionally vote for 12 hours and Democrats in many states are now voting for weeks, if not months. Do, do, does the GOP organizationally get that yet? Well, I'll tell you, Ronna McDaniel is useless, okay? She is useless. She should not be in that position, and I am so frustrated that she is. She, she never should have been uh, put back in that position. No, I don't think she gets it. And there are so many people on the ground. You know, I've had, I don't know if you're familiar at all with Scott Pressler, but I've had him on oh, my yeah. show. He's been my friend for years. He is on the ground. He is going to cities and states across this country every single day of the year trying to get people to understand the merits of early voting and ballot harvesting where it's legal and voter registration. And Ronna McDaniel has ignored this man for months. And he has been trying to reach out, trying to activate millennials and Gen Z, and she has ignored him. So, no, I don't think that the leadership of the RNC gets it. I think Ron DeSantis gets it. I think maybe Donald Trump gets it. But Republicans need to get it. I don't like early voting either. I don't like ballot harvesting either. I don't like any of these newfound post-COVID, pre-COVID, COVID mess things that have happened to our election systems. But the Democrats are going to use it whether I like it or not. So if we choose not to, get ready to keep losing because that's what's going to happen. We have to be honest about that. Tommy Lahren hosts the show. Uh, Tommy Lahren is fearless every Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, on Outkick.com. You can see her on uh, Fox regularly as well, Fox Nation as well. Tommy, the uh, House, disappointingly, to I know a lot of us, only 71 Republicans said no to raising this debt ceiling, another $4 trillion, uh, limitless spending for Joe Biden. Um, should we have expected anything less from Kevin McCarthy? I, I kind of thought, I mean, maybe naively for a second, I thought the House Freedom Caucus flexing early would kind of keep him in check, and it seemed like early on it had. And then uh, he did what they do, and uh, here we are again. How do you read it? Uh, you know, I'm disappointed. I had uh, Congressman Byron Donald on my show last week talking about this and saying that Republicans need to hold firm. And, and I was hoping that that was going to be the case. Um, I think that there's a, a big problem, a big issue uh, with Democrats constantly moving the goalposts to the left and then constantly making it seem in the hearts of hearts and minds of most Americans that somehow it's the Republicans that are obstructionist and unreasonable. But they frame the argument like that every time. So to not do something, to not raise a debt ceiling and to not message it correctly is going to be a big problem for us, at least when it comes to public opinion. So I understand the position that Kevin McCarthy was in. I'm very disappointed, you know, at certain areas and in how his, his leadership is kind of buckled under Democrat pressure. But to say that he wasn't and isn't in a hard position isn't being fair because he certainly is. We need more Republican messaging to the American people to understand why giving the government a blank check is a problem. But unfortunately, we simply cannot get the message out correctly. And that is our downfall. 
If I may, Tommy, in closing today, I wanted to ask you just because I know your husband is in um, is in uh, Major League Baseball, and I, I ask only because of what we've seen happen out there with the Dodgers. I'm intrigued. We saw a, uh, a a pitcher from the Nationals come out pretty vociferously against the Dodgers hosting this sacri- sacrilegious uh, organization called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Pretty grotesque display uh, for their pride celebration. Um, Clayton Kershaw, who pitches for the Dodgers, came out and uh, said, hey, we're going to have family uh, faith and family night in response to this. Uh, a Blue Jays pitcher re- retweeted, just re- or I guess reposted something on Instagram. He came out and apologized for it. I'm just curious generally. I'm not asking about your husband personally, but I'm asking about baseball generally. I know it's full of a lot of men of faith. Um, and I don't know if you've spoken with your husband about this at all or what you or he or – what you just generally think the responsibility or if there is a responsibility for people of faith in the game to speak out about this with the Dodgers. Yeah. You know, my, my husband and I talk about this extensively and this is something obviously that's been, um, he's former baseball player, former blue Jays player, now current coach for the Mets triple a team. So he's you know completely ingrained in all this. And I told him it's a pretty good thing that you're not still actively playing because you would be apologizing <laughs> for me every single day to which he said, I would never apologize. Um, and I believe that of my husband because he wouldn't apologize. He, he would stand for his beliefs and he doesn't care. I mean, he's Cuban <laughs> and he's not going to apologize to no one for nothing, especially for his wife. So no, uh, I also know and am good friends with Anthony Bass, who plays for the Blue Jays, who made that uh, what felt like a hostage, uh, a prisoner statement that he had to make yeah. about the posting that he made, uh, which I was really disappointed in. But also, I have to be fair because I know what it's like through my husband to know how these front offices treat conservative players. And when they want to stand up for something, uh, I know very well that they could very well be on the chopping block for one way or another in some way or some form because they choose to be political or because they choose to be outwardly Christian or conservative. So that's the unfortunate place here. I'm glad that there are some with the intestinal fortitude to speak out. There is strength in numbers. Baseball is conservative. The players are conservative predominantly. So I hope that more will stand up and will stick to their convictions and beliefs. But it's going to take a while. I got to be honest. It's going to take a while for them to feel comfortable doing that. Yeah, it's um, this happened in the NHL, too, with the pride jerseys, you know, and we saw what some of the players. It's so odd. These front offices seem to be. I mean, I don't know if most athletes are. Kurt Schilling once told me on the show that he believes 60 percent of most professional athletes are conservative. Would you agree with that assessment based on the, the people that you've hung with and gotten to know? Oh, Kurt Schilling's another one of my good friends. But, uh, yes, I do agree. And I would say with baseball, uh, not just by my own estimation, but by my husband's estimation and all the baseball players that I know, uh, I would say that baseball is probably upwards of 90 percent conservative. Yeah. Uh, so I do believe that there are a lot of conservatives, but we've created this environment, this silent majority. Right. And we always are so proud of our silent majority until it comes to something like this. And we realize that being silent is not helpful. So it's time to change things. I was hoping that the whole Bud Light target thing would give people a little confidence to know that they're not alone, but it's going to be a re-education process to teach these people, uh, athletes, public figures, you name it, that standing up for yourself will always be worth it. So we just need to continue to support those who do. Outkick.com uh, and Fox News, Fox Nation, where you can see Tommy Laren. Tommy Laren is fearless every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. She's on Twitter, Tommy Laren, L-A-H-R-E-N. Tommy, it's always a pleasure to catch up. Hope you have a great weekend. Okay, former President Trump issued a warning from Mar-a-Lago. You may have heard it. He said, quote, our currency is crashing and will soon no longer be the world standard, which will be our greatest defeat, frankly, in 200 years. That's a direct quote. From Trump. Well, central banks are reducing their U.S. dollar holdings. That's true. Uh, They're increasing their gold inventory. That's true. There are a lot of people that believe serious threats to the future value of the U.S. dollar are, are very real because of inflation and deficit spending and our increasing national debt. Now, listen, I don't give financial advice, and I'm not going to start now. But one thing that has withstood the test of time famine, wars, economic upheaval, gold. And you can own it in a tax-sheltered retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. You know, Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k 
maybe from a previous employer, into an IRA in gold. And the best part is you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Now, if you want more information on this, if this sounds interesting to you, I hope you will investigate it and research it. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I want you to reach out to the people at Birch who do business with the show. They want to talk to you about it. You can decide with them. Just text Chris to 989898, and they're going to send you a free information kit on gold. It's free. No obligation, no charge, but you can do some more reading, and I always encourage you to do that. Text Chris to 989898. Now, in March of this year, when the banks faltered and the stock market faltered, gold surged. Well, Birch Gold can help you find out how to protect your savings with gold. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of happy customers. So investigate them. Text Chris to 989898 and get your free information kit on gold. Again, that's Chris. Just text it. Text Chris to 989898 and happy reading. You know the jingle, right? For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. It's true. It really is the best night's sleep in the whole wide world. I've been sleeping on MyPillow 2.0 for the last few weeks, and it is so comfortable. I didn't really, can I be honest? I didn't really buy the whole Mike Lindell patented adjustable fill thing. I didn't know what that meant, adjustable fill. I was like, yeah, sure. The pillow's going to go flat. It doesn't go flat. You know how you buy a pillow at the store and you're like, oh, that's nice, and you sleep on it for a couple of days? I got a big, fat, heavy head, <laughs> and all it takes is a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of nights where I get a little warm, and all of a sudden that pillow just, <laughs> and a couple of weeks my neck is cricked, and it's just, it's miserable. Pillows are, I've never had luck with pillows. Well, I tell you, this fill that my pillow talks about and Mike talks about, it is adjustable, and it constantly stays, you adjust it at night, and your head is like even. It's not like, you know, crank down. It's like I've never, I haven't laid on a pillow night after night for weeks that keeps my head even with my shoulders. But this pillow does. And now, because it's my pillow 2.0, you say, what makes it more special? Well, they've got a new fabric that dissipates heat and humidity on top of that. So it stays cool all night long. There is no flipping to the cool side of the pillow. The pillow stays cool. So it's that firmness and adjustability that you like. And it's also now cool to the touch. The fabric is soft. It's great. Couple that with the Giza Dream Sheets, the My Pillow Body Pillow. I feel like I'm sleeping on a cloud every night. I really have slept like a baby lately. Christine loves her My Pillow slippers. I sent my entire Chris Stigall Show team uh, My Pillow travel pillows. Uh, got a dog bed for Eddie and his dog. Dean, my dog, sleeps on a My Pillow dog bed. One of my associate producers is loving his Giza Dream Sheets and the slippers. Look, if you want really high quality stuff, is it the cheapest? No. I'll just be honest with you. I know some people say, oh, it's expensive. Well, look, it's made in America. It has a 60-day money-back guarantee. It has a 10-year warranty on every single product Mike sells. So it's well-made, and he stands behind it. So look, that that comes you know, with a bit of a cost associated with it. It's true. You want something cheap and Chinese? Fine. Then you're not going to find that at MyPillow. But if you want a really great discount on that, go to MyPillow.com and use my name, Chris. Chris Podcast, if you type in Chris Podcast, it lets him know you listen, and I appreciate it. So the promo code is Chris Podcast. That gets you the discount on the stuff. You get a second MyPillow 2.0 if you order one. Chris Podcast is the code at MyPillow.com or call 800-932-5056. It's been a long time since we've talked to our next guest, and I'm so thrilled to have him back. Gad Saad, his name, evolutionary behavioral scientist, professor of marketing at Concordia University. Uh, you might remember when we interviewed him. Gosh, I don't know. I feel like this might have even been pre-COVID when we talked to the professor. Uh, it was called The Parasitic Mind. Um. He has a podcast since then. In fact, I think that's well, Gad Saad, let me just welcome you in instead of guessing. Let me just ask you directly. I I feel like you and I have not talked for a while, and I feel like it might have even been pre COVID. Is that possible? Good morning. Yeah, good, uh, good, great to be with you. Thank you for having me again. Uh, I I don't think it was pre COVID because, or it might have been just before COVID because my the parasitic mind came out in October 2020, and so that's when the big you know, blitz of media would have happened. So it could have been, you know, anywhere between March 2020 to October 2020 or probably shortly thereafter. But it's certainly been a few years since we've chatted. Well, I, you were brilliant. That book was brilliant. And what a time for it to come out because <laughs> we were thick in the middle of real fear in this country. And I guess what I know for sure is I have not spoken to you with a good rearview mirror look at that episode. 
uh, globally in our nation's history here in the United States, that is. Uh, how do you view the way people behaved emotionally and mentally through COVID? I know that's a big question. Uh, yeah, well, look, uh, we, we all didn't know at first what we were dealing with. So I remember when in my family we had to institute, you know, when you bring in groceries home, and this is in Montreal where it's starting to get colder in winter, right? Mm-hmm. It's not We weren't living in Southern California. We had to, you know, wipe down all of the, the you know, the groceries, you know, and everything, make sure that everything is, you know, fumigated, so to speak. And now looking back, of course, you know, most people overreacted. Uh, not, of course, we also know that uh, some of the governmental policies were, you know, grotesquely, at the very least, haphazard, if not willfully diabolical, right? I mean, for example, in Quebec, uh, Chris, we had a, a, a policy until quite recently, maybe about a year ago, where we were under complete lock curfew lockdown, where you couldn't walk your dog alone mm. in your neighborhood, right? So what is the epidemiological evidence that suggests that you can't take your walk, your dog walking after 8 p.m.? Now, quickly, they rescinded that rule or that law, but it gives you a sense of, you know, quote, the fog of war. People were instituting all kinds of crazy policies. So I'm, I'm thankful that we're out of that nonsense. Your brand new book, by the way, which comes out July 25th, you can pre-order it now, is called The Sad Truth About Happiness. S-A-A-D, by the way, is how you spell Gad's last name. S-A-A-D. The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life. Because you study behavioral health, I, I find that period of time in our nation's history, now again, our histories are only limited to our life experiences And I realize we've been through lots of traumatic things as a people well before I was ever alive, and we will again well after I'm gone. But in my limited frame of reference, yeah, we can talk about things like 9-11, Gad, but I think COVID was more traumatic to more people for various reasons than maybe we still understand. You agree? I do. So just to kind of link it to to my forthcoming book, we know, and I I have all kinds of scientific uh, references that back this up. We know that, for example, if you look at someone's uh, cholesterol scores when they're 50 versus how how good their social relationships are at the age of 50, well, the latter predicts your mortality a lot more than your cholesterol scores, right? So we, we tend to think of you know, eating healthily, exercising, which of course are very important elements. But we are a social animal, Chris. We love to connect with other people. So to the extent that under COVID, we weren't able to instantiate one of the most fundamental features of what it is to be human, which is to bond with other people, you could imagine that it had a profound effect on our psyche. So for all sorts of reasons, COVID was bad, but uh, the good news is about 50% of our genes are inscribed in our genes, so that we can't change anything about it. But that still leaves 50% up for grabs. So there are all sorts of choices that we can make, mindsets that we can adopt that could hopefully increase uh, our likelihood of being happy in life. My wife is one of these people who really does see, I mean, she sincerely does see everything as sort of glass half full. Um, she, she, she is not a pessimist. She, it doesn't really matter what's thrown at her. She will say things like, well, at least X didn't happen, you know, or it could be worse. That's now that is not me, Gad. Um, I'm glad I married that way though. How critical is it to partner with someone who at least counterbalances you if that is not you? Oh, that's, that's, that's a fantastic question. So I have a chapter, chapter three is about the two key life decisions that will either impart great happiness to you or regrettably great misery, and that is to choose the right life partner and the ideal job. Because if, if you get those two decisions right, then you're well on your way to climbing Mount Happiness. So to your point about choosing uh, the, right, the right spouse, so you're referring there about one maxim, which is opposites attract, right? You, you, know, you are more pessimistic, your wife is more optimistic, and so those you know, even out. It creates better balance within the the union. But the other maxim, Chris, is birds of a feather flock together, right? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that for the long-term stability of a relationship, it's overwhelmingly more the case. And all the scientific evidence supports that, 
that birds of a feather flock together. Now, what does that mean? Uh, on your particular trait, uh, you know, optimism versus pessimism, it might make sense that you complement one another. But when it comes to life ideals, belief systems, you know, life mindsets, choosing someone who shares your beliefs and attitudes and mindset will is much more likely to, to you know, guarantee you uh, success. So, for example, in my case, uh, the fact that both my wife and I have very, very similar fundamental values. We're both very much homebodies when it comes to how much we love our, our, our children, how much we want to always be together. It just makes for a much smoother ride, as you probably can guess. Oh, yes. Gad Saad's new book coming out July 25th, The Saad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life. Again, it's available for pre-order right now. How about faith, your spirituality, um, a personal relationship with a creator? In my case, as a Christian, um, it's it's central to me. It's kept me grounded. It's kept me focused. It's kept me from despair. It's given me hope when I felt glum. How key is that for everyone, whatever their their faith may be? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. So in in uh, in chapter two, I actually go over a overview of all of the literature linking happiness to all sorts of things, happiness and personality, happiness and culture, and to your question, happiness and religiosity. And it turns out that generally speaking, there is a positive, a a modest positive correlation between religiosity and happiness, meaning that the more religious you are, all other things considered, the more likely you are to be happy, in part because of all the reasons that you enumerated in your case. But I give a way out to people who may not be religious because I don't want them to despair about, well, what, what if I don't believe in God? What if I'm just spiritual, but I'm not, you know, monotheistic? I actually argue, Chris, that you can have, a, you know, awe-inspiring moments uh, that are akin to, you know, being divine moments just by contextualizing it within very earthly things. When I form new friendships with people, You know, when I'm having this conversation with Chris, that hopefully will make a lot of people, you know, excited about what we're talking about. When I meet a stranger in the street and then we strike up a conversation and we become good friends, when I see a beautiful natural vista, I can still be, you know, if you like, divinely inspired in a spiritual sense without necessarily couching it, you know, in a in a theological framework. So I think that uh, yes, all other things equal, being religious makes you a slightly bit happy, but even if you're not, there's all sorts of ways by which you can feel uh, spiritually awakened. Gad Saad with us again. It's called the uh, Saad Truth. S-A-A-D is the last name. The Saad Truth about happiness, eight secrets for leading the good life. Here's the other thing that I know, uh, particularly when we talk to our young people. I have an 18-year-old who's just graduated from high school, you know, his full life ahead of him. Hopefully, God willing, and um, I think there's an expectation that, you know, uh, you're going to go out there and you're going to grab life by the horns and you're going to have a happy life and everything's, you know, up, 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 up all the time. And maybe sometimes we're guilty of lying to younger people that happiness is what must be achieved at all times. Certainly social media, we know, has eroded kids thinking that everybody's leading this great life. They're not. That can get dangerous, too. Indeed. So I, I talk about uh, the anti-fragility of failure, meaning that any anything that is worth pursuing in life so that it can give you purpose and meaning is laden with potential, you know, minefields of failure. But and, and as a matter of fact, in, in that particular chapter, I give examples of pretty much every top person in you know, every domain of excellence. So the greatest soccer player of all time, Lionel Messi, Michael Jordan. J.K. Rowling as an author, and I tell their stories of rejections, right? How they were, you know, Michael Jordan was rejected in a sophomore high school basketball team. J.K. Rowling was rejected by every, you know, possible publisher that you could imagine until, you know, one finally said yes. Uh, Lionel Messi was rejected as being too small and frail, and he needed to do growth hormone therapy, and look at him now. He just won the World Cup with Argentina. So anything that is uh, going to uh, engender purpose and meaning is also likely to expose you to failure. But what makes us, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the powerful people that we are is that we overcome that. The other thing that I would say to young people is, yes, you have your, you know, your son has his whole life ahead of him, 
What you don't want for your son to do is when he's 87 and sitting on that proverbial uh, porch, looking back at his life to say, I wish I had become the artist that I always wanted to be. But instead, I listened to my dad because he thought that accounting was a safe degree <laughs> for me to pursue. Right. Yes. So oftentimes the biggest regret that sort of, you know, gnaws at us existentially is the path that we didn't follow. That's really what what what, you know, tortures us at the end of our lives. And so what I tell people is try to live an authentic life to the extent that you can. If you truly want to be an actor, uh, then maybe you need to pursue it and don't worry about not going to medical school. So I understand that there are pragmatic realities. Sometimes you've got to put bread on the table, but try to live as best as you can an authentic life. That's why, by the way, the ancient Greeks were so profound when they, you know, there's a Delphic maxim that says, know thyself, right? Everybody knows that expression, but yet we don't live by it. If you live an authentic life, you're certainly going to increase the likelihood of you being happy. Gad, can you will yourself to happiness? Can you will it? I mean, do you, or have you studied that enough to know that I, you know, if I'm down and I'm glum and I just don't feel great, can I, can I talk myself into happiness? I don't know about talking yourself into happiness, but you can take concrete actions that will increase the like see in my book chris i don't i don't i don't have the hubris to tell readers hey implement what i'm telling you and i guarantee you happiness rather what i tell people is look if you implement these mindsets if you implement these decisions it will certainly increase the likelihood of you being happy so example people who are lonely and socially isolated to the going back to the first question that we addressed at the start of our chat are, are it's very very difficult for me to be happy for me to be happy if i am socially isolated so you know what go out to a cafe with a book and as you're sitting there strike up a conversation with the person sitting next to you i know it's terrifying because you don't want to be rejected you don't want to upset someone who might be doing something else but just that little hit of dopamine that you'll get through that communal interaction might get you to be happy, if only momentarily. So I don't think we can will ourselves just, you know, in the magic of our mind, but we can take concrete actions that increase our sense of well-being. That's absolutely true. I know it is uh, a cliche, uh, but have you found this to be actually true? Money can't buy happiness. So many people think, gosh, if I didn't have the bills... Or if I just had a little more dough in the bank, I'd be happier. Any evidence to suggest oh, that's true? Yeah, I, I love I love your questions because I actually discuss pretty much everything that you asked me. So thank you for these fantastic questions. I do discuss in the book the correlation between money and happiness. And the general research finding is that they, they are correlated up to a point. So, for example, one classic study found that up to $75,000, there's a correlation between happiness and money. Now, of course, that makes sense, right? If I'm worried about whether I'm going to have enough food for my children tonight for dinner, whether I'm worried that can I pay the mortgage or, or is the bank going to take away you know, my, my house that I've worked so hard for, then I'm unlikely to exhibit you know, existential happiness. But once, once you pass that inflection point, we can debate whether it's 75,000 or 175,000, but what is absolutely true is that there is an inflection point. In other words, Elon Musk, by virtue of being the richest man who ever existed, need not be, by definition, also the happiest person. If he doesn't have good relationships, if he doesn't have a, a supportive spouse, if he doesn't have children who, who love him and respect him and vice versa, then for all intents and purposes, he may be a lot less happier than you and me, even though you know he makes more money per segment than we make in a year. So... So money is important up to a point, but beyond that, it's completely useless for your happiness score. You know, Gad, what my grandmother always used to say, uh, she, she always used to tell me, Christopher, she'd say, wherever you go, you have to take yourself with you. And I, that always, I, I, I always loved that profundity from my grandmother. Maybe it's not that profound, but the idea was uh, you can keep moving, you, you know, you can, you can go take a vacation, you can become wealthy, you can change houses, spouses, whatever, but you're always going to be there with yourself. And if you don't much care for yourself, at the end of the day, you're going to be stuck, was her point. Oh, it's actually an incredibly profound insight, but I mean, it sounds as though it's obvious, but regrettably for most people, they don't live by that maxim, right? I mean, look. As you said, most of the time you spend it in the privacy of your thoughts. If your personhood is well-structured, if you are comfortable in your skin, uh, then that's 
half the battle is won, right? So, you know, I remember one time, one of my, uh, my, my former doctoral supervisor, uh, I did my PhD at Cornell, uh, I had gone back to Cornell as a visiting professor. So he had come to my course to watch me lecture. So my professor was now coming to watch me profess to the next generation of students. And at the end of uh, uh, my lecture, he came up to me and said, boy, your mother must have loved you a lot because you, 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 you lecture with such ease and confidence. And, I, and that struck me really well because that's exactly how, you know, I think the signal that I exude, which is, of course, we all suffer at times from insecurities, but generally speaking, existentially speaking, I'm comfortable in my skin, and I think that radiates to the world. So, yeah, so I think your grandmother was exactly right. I can't wait to read this book, and I always feel so much smarter when we talk. Gad Saad, uh, The Saad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life, available for pre-order now. His last uh, remarkable bestseller was called The Parasitic Mind. And by the way, you have a podcast as well, right, Gad? I do. It's called The Sad Truth, S-A-A-D Truth. It's both available on YouTube if you want to actually see me chatting with folks, and or you can just download it if you just want to listen to it. And, you know, it amazes me how I can connect. Speaking of connections, I can connect with millions of people. When I started the show, I had no idea whether three people would, would, would line up to listen to me. And here we are many years later at almost 35 million. So it's incredible. It's humbling. And uh, I welcome everybody to come and join me. Well, thank you for giving us some of your time today, Gad. We're grateful. We hope we can talk again. The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.